I was asked by Ian Tristel, who is director of Foundation for Water, to make this presentation because, unfortunately, he was prevented from coming. So I have not uh, participated personally in the research that I'm presenting. My own background is in product development and innovation. And uh, I'm here basically because I'm uh, trying to develop devices for water improvement. Now I'll go fairly <coughs> roughly through the basics of Foundation for Water. And uh, then I'll present their r current research. And eventually I will present uh, a new research project which is coming up with my um, participation. <clears throat> now, Foundation for Water is a UK charity which John Wilkes set up in 2008 uh, with the purpose of helping water support life. It's doing research and development of flow for technology. John Wilkes <clears throat> uh, was an extraordinary, had an extraordinary understanding of dynamics of flow in nature and invented extraordinary uh, technologies. He was inspired mainly by these guys, George Adams, who was a mathematician looking mainly into projective geometry and projective geometry's relation to nature. And Theodor Schwenk was a water researcher, founder of the Institute of Law Science in Herrischried in Germany. And of course, all these people were inspired by Rudolf Steiner, founder of Anthroposophy, and biodynamic farming. And I should also mention Victor Schauberger. <clears throat> now, basic to flow forming is the vortex. As a primary archetype, uh, the aspects of the, from the aspects of cosmos through the materialistic aspects of nature into the microscopic aspects. And these people were working with copying nature long before uh, Janine Benius ben, uh, coined the term and it was established as a field of research. <clears throat> now, they have been studying flow. In these two examples, we see uh, uh, flow forms naturally made in rock, in Ace Rock in Australia, and cloud formations uh, over sea landscape. Now, <coughs> flow has three different aspects laminar, harmonic, and uh, turbulent. Now, of particular interest to uh, flow forming is the harmonic aspect, where thrust and resistance is in balance, and which becomes a rhythmical movement uh, from one side to the other. The flow form principle is generating rhythms in streaming water. Now these are actual pictures of uh, flow patterns. On the right side we have um, symmetrical flow, on the left side asymmetrical flow. These are somewhat embryo-like and uh, John studied these forms and tried to make all kinds of material forms whereby these uh, shapes and patterns could, could be produced. And eventually, he ended up with two basic principles. One is the ver vertex, and the other is the Lemniz gate, whereby water is moved from one side to the other, stepwise down a ladder. Now, is there some kind of language which could express these forms other than studying nature? And this language is mathematics. It's um, called projective geometry and it has the capacity of uh, describing natural forms through what they call 
path curved surfaces. Now these surfaces are described, described in um, parameters. This is a lambda parameter describing uh, going from one floor to another. And uh, to put a long story short, when this lambda factor describing these curves is uh, positive or going towards zero, then tipping over into a negative value, uh, then the cone or the bud form <laughs> becomes a vortex. So the vortex is actually the inverted cone. <laughs> and as you know, the cone is where all life is emerging in uh, nature. Uh, buds, flowers. For instance, if you have a flower bud, which uh, springs out into a flower, you, it turns into a vortex shape. <coughs> so we have kind, all kinds of ways of producing these uh, vortex uh, patterns. Um, manually or through computing. And the Foundation for Water has the knowledge and the tradition of applying projective geometry in the design process. Now the design process usually starts with clay modeling according to uh, path curve uh, analysis, going into form making, prototyping, material choice and production. Uh, lately, they have been working with uh, DAC, CAD and uh, CAM into uh, exact forms uh, produced in this way and there are several materials at play. This is a list of special importance now is the geopolymers uh, which my, many of you may have heard of. Some examples, double pair vessels, symmetrical flow, then you have the asymmetrical flow forms going larger to one side and larger to the other side uh, every second step. Uh, S-shaped flow, central flow, seven-fold cascade where you have um, increasing amplitude and decreasing uh, frequency and then returning again. Radial flow, and it's been intensively used for black and gray water treatment in Scandinavia. It's been used uh, very intensively also in public spaces, more artistically. John's uh, uh, artistic um, capabilities are easy to see here. <coughs> it's been used uh, particularly in New Zealand for biodynamic pre preparation. As you know, this is a homeopathic dilution, uh, eventually spread on large areas of land in New Zealand by airplane. It's used for effluent transformation into manure. It's used for food production. <coughs> this is a bakery in Germany. And it's used for grain milk production in Norway. And uh, treating stagnant water, which is becoming a huge problem worldwide. Here is a quote for, for, from the Director of Parks in Cambridge, New Zealand. The change in water quality is astounding. Now, <coughs> flow forms are used in multiple sectors. And since 1972, uh, more than 5,000 aggregates have been erected worldwide. So, <coughs> going into the uh, research. Now, Foundation for Water claim that water can be energized. John Wilkes was my friend. He used to live my, with my family in Oslo when he was lecturing there. And uh, repeatedly, I used to uh, ask him, John, can you prove this? And he was at a loss. Now, towards the end of his life, uh, he was joined by a lot of people with academic training who helped him into a, a new path where they tried to do research on the effects of flow forming. And there were quite a few methods developed. Uh, actually, basically, they were developed in uh, Dornach in Switzerland in the 1920s. And they've been improved along the way. First of all, 
uh, capillary dynamolysis, where water samples are <coughs> allowed to rise in specialized paper through capillary motion, and then uh, silver nitrate and ferrous sulfate is added, and these kind of patterns emerge, which can be interpreted. Here you see a control on the right side, and this is uh, flow form treated water on the left. Um, round filter chromatography <laughs> is basically the same, um, only that it's radially expanding. Crystallization dishes, um, where copper chloride is basically disordered, and when it comes in uh, connection with uh, biological substances, it becomes ordered. Uh, here you have a control, and these two samples are treated through different kind of flow form devices. Here's the control, and here's the device. <coughs> and then, fourth drop picture method, where water drips into a glycerol water s uh, sample mixture at one drop per second, for instance. 5 seconds, 10 seconds, 15, 20 seconds. Uh, and uh, a resulting pattern appears at the bottom of a disk, and, uh, which can be correlated to water quality. Here is control, here is uh, aerated water, and here is flow form uh, treated water. And last but not least, uh, growth experiments have been intensely uh, used lately. This is a case for a recent case from 2013 where coriander is grown in moderate sunlight. Uh, uninfluenced water here and becomes this structure. On the right you have coriander plants grown in the same moderate uh, sunlight and the same soil but watered with influ uh, water influenced by rhythm and dynamic flow. And this particular pattern of growth is only reached uh, in bright sunlight. <laughs> and it's actually grown in moderate sunlight. And according to, uh, uh, to uh, these people, extra light can only have affected the morphology by entering the roots via water. This is the whole plant, section of the plant, same results. New case, <coughs> wet growth, water samples taken after one hour of cir circulation, growth measurements after 8 to 16 days of growth, 12 seeds for each sample, all glasses placed on a rotating table, uh, a table to have equal um, light conditions. Statistical analysis with National Institute of Health image software and a significant factor of p-values less than 5%, meaning that uh, less than 5% could have happened by chance. Untreated control wall through the same pumping procedure. And in this case, we use a cascade of 16 flow form uh, vessels openly in one uh, case, and the other inside an uh, ecosidodecahedron. And this is to show how um, influences, cos cosmic or planetary influences can influence the process. Controls, as you see, what happens is that root lengths vary considerably. And this is a parallel experiment in, in pamphlets. And you have the same result. Uh, these are the readings, controls on the left, and this two kinds of applications on the right, where you see that the, the increase on the ecosidodecahedron case is uh, quite large. <coughs> and these are depictions, control, flow form, and the ecosidiodicahedron case, where you can see um, structure, structural improvements 
uh, in the cases. Case two, you have <coughs> an open cascade. You have one cascade within a, a wooden icosahedron and one cascade within a bronze icosahedron and the fourth is a rocker whereby the form is uh, made through rocking <laughs> this kind of device. Um, these are the growth experiments. You see the different uh, sizes of the root length. And these are the measurements. And here is something funny because the case where the flow form is uh, mounted within a bronze icosahedron decreases compared to the uh, control. And this is explained by cosmic influences. In this particular case, as you know, that biodynamic uh, farming uh, takes into consideration, uh, consideration moon phases. Uh, and in this case, it was not done. Whereas in the others, uh, it was uh, accounted for. And, but an overall increase. And then the crystallization pictures of the same cases. And lastly, three cases compared. A 38 uh, members column, a 16 members column within an icosahedron, and an open vortex case with only uh, vortexing from one step to the other. And in this case, you get some extreme differences in the measurements, up to 400%. But they say that uh, they take some reservation on the vortex cascade result because earlier tapping than other samples and storage in large container. So, <coughs> Foundation for water is not naive. <laughs> Qualitative research is not accepted by science as proof of the capacity of water to be energized or vitalized. So my contribution here is to suggest a new uh, research project where after meeting uh, Jerry Pollack, <laughs> uh, we decided to try to get him engaged as a collaborator in order to get a correlation between the qualitative uh, measurements and quantitative uh, research. So we have set up a collaborative project. Uh, it will correlate parallel studies to quantitative and qualitative methods and uh, quantitative methods will be supplied by Pollack's lab in Seattle, basically through spectrometer me measurements. These are the research questions. And uh, the, 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 the project is called Energizing Water Through Dynamic Flow Treatment. And actually, the day before yesterday, I got the message that it will most certainly <laughs> become funded. Uh, to what extent can ex expected energy increase be measured consistently in water treatment devices of different kinds and geometries? Now, we are going to analyze several different types and apply the quantitative method basically in this first question to try to quantify increase, energy increase. To what extent can a correlation be detected between measured energy increase in specific water samples and improved effects of these samples used for plant growth and depiction experiments? So this is the correlation between the two. To what extent can design of flow surfaces and storage containers, which is based on projective geometry, influence the capacity for energy increase? Now here, <laughs> We want to compare into, uh, basically intuitively made forms, which has been the tradition, with exactly projective geometry 
uh, based designs and see if there is a difference uh, as, and take it as a um, proof of the, uh, the of using projective geometry as a basis for flow form designs. We find this very interesting. And finally, to what extent can an explanation of energy increase in treatment devices be formulated through basic studies of water's electromagnetic information potential, which is Jerry's part of it. <laughs> in a second, you can probably explain a little more. Um, as you all know, a strong light absorption peak appears in uh, easy water at 270 nanometers wavelength in spectrometer analysis of water sample. Now, <coughs> uh, spectrometer me measurements of water easy content can thereby display equivalent energy level before and after treatment, which is confirmed by Jerry. Uh, and these principles will be applied quantitatively and qualitatively, as I said. And Pollack intends to propose a theoretical model of the mechanism of information and transmission in water, nothing less. Joint dissemination through scientific journals. And thank you.